Kairote friends, welcome to Classics in Color, your weekly dive into some of the ancient world's wackiest facts. I'm Mark Graves, and today we're checking out some accounts of necrophilia in ancient Greece and Egypt. Apologies, but I have two quick notes. First off, I'm dealing with a bit of a cold, so if my voice or energy is off, I apologize. Second, I got the quotes of this video from a book entitled In Bed with the Ancient Greeks by Paul Crystal. Now, he doesn't provide that much extra as far as analysis goes. He basically just provided these quotes, uh, but they are good quotes and I am grateful for them. And he also has a lot of other quotes and examples that have to do with other aspects of sexuality in the ancient world. So if that's something you're interested in, definitely check that out. We're going to start off by looking at some Herodotus. So Herodotus was an ancient Greek historian. He's pretty famous. You may have heard of him and he's possibly my favorite historian of all time. He is just so quirky and he has so many fascinating little nuggets about all kinds of miscellaneous things, including necrophilia. So he has two passages that touch on this topic. The first has to do with the ancient Egyptians. He basically says that there's a custom among the Egyptians that before you hand off your wife over to the embalmers that you wait a couple of days, especially, he notes, if they're considered particularly attractive or important, well known. He says you just want to let them sit for three, four, five days before you turn them over to the embalmers because allegedly a few embalmers were caught having relations with these bodies that were entrusted to them and people sort of assume that if you wait for the body to age a little bit <laughs> that will lower the temptation. So there is our first passage for you. Next up, we are still looking at Herodotus's history, but now we're looking at some Greeks, specifically a tyrant named Periander and his wife named Melissa. Now, Melissa is dead and Periander is negotiating with her ghost. He's trying to get her to tell him where his friend buried some treasure. So it's kind of a complicated story, so let's just read the whole thing. For he, Periander, had sent messages to the oracle of the dead on the river Acheron in Thesprotia to inquire concerning a deposit that a friend had left. But the apparition of Melissa said that she would tell him not, nor reveal where the deposit lay, for she was cold, she said, and naked. For the raiment Periander had buried with her had never been burnt, and availed her nothing. And let this, said she, be her witness that she spoke the truth, that it was a cold oven wherein to Periander had cast his loaves, wink, wink. When this message was brought to Periander, for he had had intercourse with the dead body of Melissa and knew her token for true, immediately after the message he made a proclamation that all the Corinthian women should come out into the temple of Hera. So they came out as to a festival wearing their fairest adornment. And Periander set his guards there and stripped them all alike, ladies and serving women, and heaped all the garments in a pit where he burned them, making prayers to Melissa all the while. When he had done so and sent a second message, the ghost of Melissa told him the place where the deposit of the friend had been laid. So that is a crazy passage. Let's unpack that a little bit, go back over it. So Periander wants to know where this buried treasure is. And so he sends a messenger to inquire of a ghost. And the ghost that shows up is his dead wife. But she's grumpy because apparently when he did all her funeral rites and everything, he neglected to burn some clothes. And that's how you get clothes to ghosts, I guess. And so now she's a naked cold ghost and she's very grumpy about this. And she says she won't give him any information until he gets her some clothes and to prove that she's a real ghost and this is a real oracle and the messenger isn't just making it up she tells the messenger a secret that only the two of them as a married couple know namely that he had sex with her dead body before burying it and since Periander knows that this secret is indeed true he trusts this messenger and then he throws a big party and invites all these women and basically tricks them into coming in their nicest clothes so that he can strip them naked and burn those clothes for his wife. And then she gives him the information about the treasure. And there are just so many things about that story that are so strange, so crazy. I don't honestly know what to think about it all. It makes me wonder if it's true. 
in any, <laughs> to any extent, but maybe it is just crazy enough that there is a grain of truth in there. We'll never know. Last but not least, we're going to look at another Greek historian, this time Xenophon. He is telling a story about a fellow named Aegialius, telling the story of his wife and their romance to another gentleman, Habrokomes, I think is how you pronounce his name. So the story starts off very sweet and innocent enough. The two of them fell in love when they were youngsters, but her parents betrothed her to a different family, and so in order to be together, they had to run away. And the rest of it is too good, so I'm just going to read it straight from Xenophon. When the Spartans discovered our flight, they condemned us to death. We had to struggle to make a living here, but we were happy and thought we enjoyed every advantage since we had each other. Thelxenoe died here not long ago, and her body is not buried. I keep her with me, and I'm always kissing her and being with her. As he was speaking, uh, namely Aegialius, he took Habrocalmes into the innermost bedroom and showed him Thelxenoe, now an old woman, but in Aegialius' eyes still a young girl. Her body was embalmed by the Egyptian method, for the old man was also experienced in this. And so, Abacromes, my boy, he said, this way I can always talk to her as if she were alive and lay with her and dine with her. And whenever I come home tired from fishing, the sight of her comforts me. For the way you see her now is not the way I see her. My boy, I think of her as she was in the Conia, as she was when we eloped. I think of our festival. I think of our covenant. So super creepy, but also kind of sweet, maybe. Again, I'm not really sure what kind of reaction I'm supposed to be having to this story. Let me know what your reactions are. So thank you so much for watching this video. Special thank you as always to subscribers and to Patreon members. And I hope to see all of you again next week. Karate.